Thank you very much indeed, Zeri, for the introduction. Um, particularly like the phrases um, illustrious uh, and respected. Uh, it was one of those uh, speeches uh, such as an American senator once said, um, my father would have appreciated that and my mother might even have believed it. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off with the um, book that Zeri referred to. It's called The Italians. Not actually a novel, it's, it's, it's a non-fiction work. Um, and uh, often what I'm asked is, why did you write that book? Um, I've been asked it several times today in various classes. Um, you know, what was your inspiration for writing the book? And in my case, the question is actually better, um, why did I not write the book sooner? Because I'd written a similar book about Spain at an earlier stage. Uh, it was called initially The Spaniards and later The New Spaniards when it was revised. Um, and it, when I came in 1994 for the first time to Italy, I had the idea that I could repeat the trick, do something similar uh, about Italy. Uh, but the Spaniards was written about a country that had just undergone an immense transformation. It had been transformed from a dictatorship uh, under General Francisco Franco into a democracy in a very few years. And this had revolutionized many different aspects of life in the country, particularly the society. Um, when I arrived in Italy in 1994, I thought that maybe the same thing was going to happen in, in Italy, that uh, the country at that time was in the throes of what was called tangentopoli. In other words, it was being convulsed by an anti-corruption drive led by the prosecutors in Milan. And it seemed as if an entire old order was collapsing, which politically it did. The Christian Democrat Party and the old Communist Party were either um, in the throes of falling apart or had actually done so. So it looked like there was going to be big change coming. But then the, 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 the powers of inertia in Italy, which are considerable, began to assert themselves and by the middle of the 1990s it was clear that Italy was not going to have this kind of social revolution that I'd witnessed in, in Spain. That was one reason why I hesitated before writing the book. The other one was that in the 19, 1990s I was working exclusively for The Guardian as their Southern Europe correspondent and I was traveling a lot from Portugal across to Turkey. So about half of my time was being spent in Italy, but the half of it was outside. So by the time that I got to the end of the decade, uh, I was posted in 1999 to Germany, to Berlin. I just didn't feel that I understood the country enough to be able to embark on writing uh, the book that I wanted to write, which was going to be something more interpretative. Um, I, I felt that Italy is a very complex country. It's a country um, with wide regional variations um, and innumerable dialects, a country in which many people who are Italian don't speak Italian as their first language. It's a country where the people can draw on more than 200 hand gestures when they speak. I say in the book that I was able to count up until 90, but uh, I subsequently met a documentary filmmaker who said, you're wrong about that. Actually, um, we've researched this and there are 200 different hand gestures, all with a specific meaning, some of which are um, regional variations. Italy is a country in which there are probably at least as many ways in which to make coffee, a nation where the main opposition party, 
was founded by a comedian and has its headquarters on a website. A country which, in view of what I've just been saying, um, perhaps not surprisingly, feels the need for a minister for simplification. A country with cities that most Italian, non-Italians, have probably never heard of, Trani, Vercelli, that house more cultural treasures than you will find in entire US states. A society that has 13 words for a coat hanger and none for a hanger drop. By pure chance, I came back to Italy in 2003, um, and I was given a job working for The Economist, uh, which allowed me to concentrate exclusively on Italy. So I began to accumulate more of the kind of knowledge that I felt that I needed to write the book that I wanted to do. Um, but I kept on getting these unnerving surprises, things that I thought I understood that I turned out I didn't really understand at all. Um, I give one example in my book. In 2006, there was an election in Italy, and the swing state in the election was Lazio, the area around Rome, the region around Rome. And Berlusconi, uh, who was the prime minister, um, and who was in danger of losing power at that election, and did indeed lose power in the end, but the, by a very narrow majority, um, came down to Rome to try and gather the last few votes to his side. And Berlusconi is from Milan and has never really felt comfortable in Rome. And when he came down, on the first day, he made an appalling mistake. He insulted Francesco Totti. Now, I don't know how many of you know about um, soccer and about Francesco Totti, but he is the legendary captain of AS Roma. And he, uh, I can remove that. That's great. That's perfect. Um, he had said um, that Totti was an idiot for voicing the opinion that he would vote for the centre-left in that election. And obviously, overnight, some of his advisors had got to him and had said, you've got to do something about this, because otherwise you're going to lose the election. And he went on radio that morning, and he gave an interview in which he said, now, you know, Totti is a great footballer and a great lad, and I really don't have anything against him, and we really do get on quite well. He's a great chap. Uh, and, you know, he said, I mean, look, he said, his wife, works for my television network. And I went out that day to have a coffee with one of the um, journalists I work with. I have my, my office is in Corriere della Sera. And she and I went out to have a coffee together. And on the way back, I must have said something like, so they've made it up, or they've, they've uh, buried the hatchet. I can't remember the phrase that I used in Italian. And she stopped dead in the street. And she looked at me in astonishment, and she said, you haven't understood, have you? So I said, understood what? So she said, that wasn't burying the hatchet or making it up. That was a threat. He was saying, Dotty, your wife works for my television station. One more remark like that, and she loses her job. Um, now, I think that... <laughs> The, um, that is enough to make anyone feel that they need to question things when they're presented with them in Italy. And it was that feeling of uncertainty that deterred me for a long time from writing the book. But gradually, I felt that I understood more and more. I started to jot down ideas. I started to draw lines on pieces of paper between the ideas. And the result is this book that Zeri uh, told you about earlier on, The Italians. Now, what kind of book is it? One way of defining it is as a bookseller's nightmare. 
It is a book that they do not know where to put in the bookstore. They don't know what shelf to put it on because it's, it's not about contemporary politics and economics, though it does touch on both of those subjects. It's not a book of history, but it does include historical passages. It's not a book of travel, though it does give descriptions of some parts of Italy. Um, Amazon in the United Kingdom, at the beginning, for reasons best known to themselves, put it under health and social affairs. Um, they've now moved it since then to a rather more suitable section of human geography. Um, it's a book that sits in a micro niche of books that are portraits or snapshots, if you like, of a nation. The book uh, deals with a wide range of facets of Italian life from food to football and from sex to superstition. It's the book that I would like to have read uh, when I first arrived in Italy. Somebody I know called it a search for the Italian inn. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that phrase, the inn. It comes from Freudian psychology and the definition in Webster's is the part of the mind in which innate instinctive impulses and primary processes are manifest. Which brings us to some of the qualities that um, earlier on Dr. Love was talking about and which they like people giving talks to um, touch upon in, in the, this series. Um, international understanding, um, and truth. And those really are going to be at the core of what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this lecture. Um, I certainly don't expect you to regard me as representing beauty. Um, it's very dis debatable as to whether I represent goodness, but truth and international understanding are definitely part of my stock in trade. Um, the issue is raised by a book like this of whether Italy can have an id and whether indeed any nation can be said <coughs> to have one. And I'd like to take those questions in reverse order. The, for the second, whether any nation can be said to have something approaching a national character is highly relevant in this setting, I think, of an international school, and important because of late, exercises like this have begun to assume a certain kind of academic respectability. Um, I've written the New Spaniards and the Italians thinking that I was writing a kind of journalistic anthropology, if you like, but um, it happens that I, I give a course at Stanford University uh, in, at their Florence campus about contemporary Italy. And I turned up to give one of my talks there and I ran into some other um, academics from California who were staying in Florence. And the, uh, one of them approached me and she said, I'm very uh, pleased to meet you because your book is top of our reading list. So I thought, why would that be the case? Uh, do they give a talk on Italian history or politics or something like that. But no, it actually was top of the reading list uh, for a course of what is called cultural psychology. It's the, one of the most innovative areas of psychology, which argues that people are not just formed by nature and nurture, um, but in many cases by the culture in which they are born. That the, Nurture is not just the influence of their family, the influence of their peers, but also the, the influence of the nation into which they are born. Um, the, um, I have to say that cultural respectability is something that we all need to be slightly skeptical about. There was a time when 
academics believe that there was a substance inside every combustible element um, which would burst out and cause fire to uh, occur. And this was called phlogiston. Um, for a long time, it was believed to exist until it was proved that it didn't. Um, in the same spirit, academics at one time believed that there was a planet between Mercury and the Sun, which was called, they called Vulcan. Um, then that was found not to exist. So anyone writing a book like this, I think, needs to be um, pretty careful that they don't fall into the same kind of territory. And academics pursuing uh, the concept of cultural psychology also need to be careful. Um, generalizing can certainly take you into very dangerous areas. Um, the belief in ethnic stereotypes led the Nazis in the last century to commit the world's most industrialized genocide. The new Spaniards, to a certain extent, reflected that kind of sensitivity. What I tried to do with the, with the book was to explain in as factual a way as I possibly could the developments that had taken place in society and not to generalize too much about any kind of national character. The Italians represents a, a slightly more uh, relaxed view, which I think has spread in the last 10, 15 years or so, that an acceptance that trying to identify traits in a particular country or territory doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up like the theoreticians behind the Nazis measuring people's skulls and trying to derive theories as to who is superior or inferior. And I think that that is right um, as long as you bear in mind that what you're doing is approximate and impressionistic. Um, I do have slight qualms about raising this kind of sketch of a people or a country to the level of an academic discipline. The other key consideration, I think, is that you must bear in mind that if you're writing a book about a people or a territory, that it is a snapshot, as I said earlier on, that what you're saying is temporary, that it is going to be outdated. It's already true that some of the things that I wrote only a few years ago, three years ago, in the Italians are no longer true. People change, societies change, countries change. And you only have to look at Italy as an example of that. The way in which over recent years the influence of the Roman Catholic Church has receded in Italy. The way that the position of women has changed very radically just in the last few years and the influence on the society of immigration on a large scale. Now, I said there were two issues. One of them was whether the, you could write meaningfully about any nation. And the second was whether you can write meaningfully about the Italians and about Italy. Certainly, there are very considerable differences between north and south and from one region to another. Um, there is a recent book written about Italy called The Pursuit of Italy by one of my compatriots, a gentleman by the name of David Gilmore, who is a very good and entertaining historian, who in his book pursues two theses one of them is that unification, the unification of Italy in the 1870s, was a mistake. And the second is that the Italy is not really a country, but a conglomeration of regions, each with their own traditions, which are just waiting to 
break apart. Now, I have some sympathy with the first contention. I think that the benefits of unification for the south of the country were um, debatable. That the country, the area of the Mezzogiorno became much poorer over the period that followed unification between 1870 and about 1945. The average um, of the GDP per capita, that's a measure of the uh, wealth of a, a, a region, um, fell from about 80% of the whole of Italy to around 50%. So the south at the beginning was around about 80% as wealthy as the rest of the country. Um, by the 1940s, that figure had fallen down to 50%, which is a dramatic um, change, which seems to have been brought about largely by pursuing economic policies that favored the north more than they did the south. Um, the, um, particularly the, take, the, the removal of tariff barriers and pursuit of free trade in a number of different areas. The um, second contention, though, is what causes me problems. The idea that Italy is just a fissile conglomeration of regions that could explode at any moment. Um, there is no active separatist movement in Italy at the moment. Um, there might one day arise such a movement in the Veneto, um, but so far all that's been seen has been um, separatist movements that have gained popularity in Sicily and in Sardinia, and they've been relatively short-lived. Sardinians uh, who do have a separate language have many of the arguments that would allow them to create a nationalist movement. Uh, the nationalists there are very divided. And on Sicily, when there was a strong separatist movement after the Second World War, it became um, tangled up with the mafia and discredited itself. So as of now, we don't really have a separatist movement. The Northern League tried to create this idea of Padania, the north of Italy, the Po Valley, which could be made into a separate state. But the Northern League in the last few years under its new leader, uh, Matteo Salvini, has decided wants to pursue a different route and to go off and become rather like the Front National, the National Front in France, a radical right-wing group. Um, other factors, I think, that are underestimated by Italians are a common educational system, a shared belief in the importance of family bonds, and until recently, a high degree of ethnic homogeneity. There is no minority in Italy like the Basques in Spain who do not even speak an Indo-European language. Two other factors, I think, are rarely discussed by Italians themselves. One of them is that most Italians, when they owe a loyalty to something other than the state, tend to cite a city. If you ask um, Italians who will tell you, and many will, oh, I don't feel Italian. You say, well, what do you feel? They'll say, I feel Neapolitan, or I feel Sienese, or I feel Milanese. Um, and in doing so, what they're saying is that their loyalty is to a unit that can never become a state. You know, you can imagine that Catalonia in Spain could become a country. It's big enough. It would be about the same size as Belgium. It would have roughly the same population as Belgium. So it's a feasible state. But Siena cannot become a state. Naples, just the city, 
could not become a state. So what the feeling of dissociation from the nation, if you like, doesn't lead on to anything that is politically coherent as a nationalism. <coughs> to a certain extent, the quality that Italians describe as campanalismo, that is, the affection that you feel for your local town or city, is a kind of an inoculation against the separatist nationalism, which really does threaten to pull apart Spain, and which now looks as if it might pull apart my own country, the United Kingdom. So I think that it's far likelier that Britain or Spain will see an effective secession of, let's say, Scotland or Catalonia before Italy sees anything um, of the same kind uh, happening in their country before. The other factor is that in their history, Italians may have been oppressed, um, but they have not been oppressed by other Italians. The uh, history of Italy is one in which foreigners have often come in and have dominated the local population. In the case of a country like Spain, that's not the case. The Catalans feel resentment against the Castilians because they were forced into a union that was dominated by the Castilians, and they feel that their traditions were abolished by their fellow Spaniards, if you like. Um, for all these reasons, I do feel that there is, however loosely, something that you can call an Italian identity. It's one that Italians themselves kind of kick against in many ways, but if anybody doubts that there is such a thing as Italianness, then I suggest the best thing would be to wait until one day when there is a international soccer match and go along to any bar and see if people are cheering or not for the Azzurri. Thank you very much. We definitely have time for questions right now, so if you do have a question, please uh, let us know. Can I just say it from here? Sure. <clears throat> um, why did you choose to write about a... Well, like, I understand that you live in Italy currently, and you speak Italian, but why do you decide to write a book about foreign nations as opposed to your own nation? Ah, good question. Um, I think it's very difficult to write about your own nation. It's difficult enough to write a book about a country when you're living in it. You don't have the distance. The first one that I wrote, The Spaniards, was written after I had left Spain the first time, and I found it much easier to use that distance to get my ideas sorted. Um, I wrote the Italians as much of it as I could when I was outside the country. So uh, we've discussed this in one of the classes earlier, um, that <coughs> correspondents do need that feeling of detachment from the people that they're writing about. And, it's a, a kind of a, a, a strange pattern that you get um, when you, you live abroad. The initial reaction when people arrive in a country is euphoria. They love the country. They are um, wildly keen about it. And that then leads into a period in which the pendulum swings to the opposite extreme and people get very irritated by everything in that country. Uh, this is something that is taught, for example, to diplomats before they leave to go on foreign postings, that they must be aware of this 
because it will colour the way in which they report on the country. Unfortunately, they don't teach this enough, in my opinion, to journalists. Maybe they're not aware of this psychological phenomenon. So the, 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 the pendulum goes longer, then it goes the other way, but not quite as much, and then it goes back and back and back until you settle into a feeling, and it can take years, that you are living in a place that has its uh, good points and its bad points, um, but it, it's somewhere that you just accept. Um, I think it normally takes longer than diplomats are given. They're not normally given, unless they're ambassadors, just three years in which to, to make that acclimatization. And they're probably still having the pendulum going back and forth during that period. Um, correspondents need to maintain, on the one hand, they need to integrate. They need to find out about the country, become accustomed to it. But at the same time, they do need to see it through foreign eyes. Otherwise, they start to assume too much knowledge, and their writing gets um, devalued as a result. So all the time, we're trying to keep that, that distance. Part of what a foreign editor does is to try and assess where uh, correspondents are on that scale between absolute integration and complete detachment. And some of us can spend many years in a country and still have that outsider's feeling. Uh, others um, very quickly get over it and need to be moved on. So one of the things that the foreign correspondent, uh, the foreign editor has got to do is to judge um, just how far somebody has, if you like, gone native. Uh, and at that point, they won't be of so much use to the news organization I have a question myself. Okay. So in a class, I think about a year ago, I was talking to my students and they were saying, I was asking the question, what makes me old among the many things that make me old? And um, everyone started to say email, email, email. We hate email. You old people are obsessed with email. We don't want to use it. We'd love to get rid of it. And one of the things I'm just curious about, I mean, we have an audience here of people who are not only from hundreds of different nations, but also each of you is often from two or three different nations. And I'm curious to know if you could have something you would want to say to an upcoming audience of journalism, what would you want to say? Of, of journalism. Yeah. Of journalists. Journalists um, and journalism. Yeah, I think, well, one of the comments I would make about that is that Journalists, um, we, we have a great incentive for keeping up with the times. Um, as no newspaper editor is going to keep on somebody who becomes deliberately fuddy duddy. They don't like the idea that their reporters of whatever age cannot understand what is happening at the moment. It's a great incentive to remain contemporary. You know, in many other professions, it doesn't really matter. You can cease to be interested in what is contemporary and still do your job pretty well. You can't do that as a journalist. And one of the great challenges for journalists in recent years has been to keep abreast of technology as it changes. So there was a generation that did not want to go towards the anything digital in a newspaper. There are others who then said when what we call modular makeup came in, so the composition of the paper not being done on paper by sub-editors, copy editors, but rather um, being a series of modules into which you had to slot the story. There were people who dropped out at that stage who just said, I don't want to know about this. Um, there were plenty of people actually dropped out even earlier because they didn't want to know about computers. And of late, the pace has, if anything, got faster. I mean, you've got a lot of people of older generations who are maybe just getting to grips with, with email, um, probably not in my profession, I mean, but, but who would now be expected to be moving on to WhatsApp, Snapchat, 
Instagram we mentioned earlier on. Um, and so there's that constant pressure to be contemporary, to be aware of the ways that people are communicating, but also the ways in which people are uh, entertaining themselves, uh, and so on and so on. So it's not a profession in which you can afford to, to grow old, if you like. And that gives a great advantage to young people who want to go into the profession, because they don't have to consciously keep up with many of the things that older people do. And there's always that big use for the very youngest reporters and, and writers. So that's one of the things that I would say. Um, I think if I were addressing a, an audience of would-be journalists, I think that at this stage I might even be saying, do you really want to go into this profession? Because it is being shaken by an earthquake more than perhaps any I know. And we don't, really don't know what's going to come out of it. Um, it changes every, every time you look at it. It seems to have undergone not just a change, but perceptions of what can be done to continue providing journalistic output have changed. Um, for a long time, the view of the most um, sophisticated editors was that unless you were publishing a publication that people had to buy, so Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, that kind of thing, you, if you were publishing general news, so you were the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Guardian or uh, Le Monde, then what you needed to do was to find eyeballs. In other words, you needed to be able to, to, to get market share. The more people that you could get, the better. And to do that, you made, it, you made your website free of charge. Now, the theory was that the advertising would inevitably follow the eyeballs. But that's not what's happened, because the eyeballs are not going directly to the site because that particular person wants to read, say, The Guardian or Al-Haram or, or whatever. They go in through a search engine or maybe through Facebook. Um, and it is Facebook and Google which are picking up the advertising as a result. And the latest thinking actually has gone 360 degrees and there are a lot of people, and we were discussing this uh, yesterday, Dr. Love and I, a lot of people who are now saying that the best way is to create a print edition, because that does bring in revenue, but to have a paywall on your website so that people are forced to pay, and then hope that the rest of the profession follows you down that track. The weakness in that argument is that some news organizations can't put up a paywall. The BBC is one. So no matter what happens, you'll still be able to get your news from the BBC. And that's a powerful disincentive to quality journalistic sites like the New York Times or The Guardian from, from doing that, because their audience can very easily go elsewhere. What were you thinking at the age of 17 when you went to be <laughs> <laughs> Um Well, yeah, it's, it's a long story. Um, I'll have to try and keep it as short as possible. I was working for the university newspaper. I actually didn't want to become a journalist. I, I started off being fascinated by the theatre, and I wanted to become a theatre director. And uh, I went, I, I did a lot of travelling before I went to university, and I enjoyed that very much, and I was concerned that if I went into the theatre world, I'd never be able to travel again. So I thought, well, I'll give journalism a try. And uh, I enrolled to work on the university newspaper. And there was, at this time, a civil war going on in Nigeria, as Sarah said earlier on. And 
I um, went, I, it was a, back in the period when people took students seriously. Uh, and probably if I tried to do this now, I wouldn't get away with it if I were your age. Uh, I got in touch with the Nigerian embassy in London and the office of the charge d'affaires for the rebels. And I said, if I come down, could I do an interview with you for the Cambridge University newspaper? And uh, they said yes. And they put aside time to see me. And I went down and I interviewed the Nigerian ambassador. And then I went to see the Biafran rebel charge d'affaires. And I was asking him um, some question. And he said, well, why don't you go and see for yourself? And I said, I couldn't possibly, I'm you know, 18 year old student, how could I go out there? And he said, well, we have these aid planes that take down supplies and we could put you on one of those. And um, uh, at that point, I, I was quite worried about being sponsored by the country concerned, by the government taking kind of their hospitality, their ticket. So I linked up with another student who had actually been in Vietnam during the war there. And he and I set about trying to find a proper journalistic sponsor at some newspaper or radio program or TV station that would send us out there. And of course, the reaction was that we would turn up at these places and they'd listen to what we had to say and then they would just say, well, I'll screw off, kid, because you know, why should we send out an 18-year-old when we've got our own very um, experienced uh, reporters and correspondents? And we'd gone the rounds and we'd spoken to everybody and got nowhere. And I was at home and um, the telephone rang and uh, I picked it up and um, it was one of the television programs that we had approached. And they said, um, do you still have your visa to go to Biafra? And I said, yes, I do. And they said, um, well, um, you know what's happened, don't you? I said, no, what? So they banned British journalists. So you actually, I mean, what I had were pure gold. And uh, so did my colleague from Oxford. And they said, what we will do is to um, tell a little bit of a, a story and say that you've been able to get together a, a, a team of a camera crew um, from London University, London University uh, Film Cooperative. And we went back and said that that was what had happened and we got in. And um, at that time, you know, it just seemed like a great adventure. Um, but I didn't really know quite what I was um, uh, biting off, um, quite what I was letting myself in for. Uh, we um, got into a very, um, uh, very nasty situation um, because I was in the capital when the front line suddenly moved around and um, uh, we were isolated from the others in the um, crew. Uh, they had a very hairy time up at what was then the front, and then the town that I was in was strafed and bombed. And I got out uh, thanks to the president of this rebel republic who laid on a car for me and um, one of the others to get to the airport, and then did the same to the others. And so we, we escaped by the, the, um, the skin of our teeth. Um, so, um, and, and uh, I mean, it's not a course of action I frankly would advise anybody to uh, take, uh, neither um, for um, reasons of mental health. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I suffered actually from nightmares for a, a year afterwards because of some of the things that I'd seen there. Um, nor for grounds of academic distinction because when I uh, got back late uh, for the summer term at my college in Cambridge, um, I found out that I'd missed the first year exams and the, um, the staff of my college were deeply unimpressed uh, with this. And I went to see my tutor, who was a crystallographer, a man uh, completely devoid of any kind of sense of humor. And um, I, he said to me, um, why did you miss your prelims, as they're called, preliminary exams? And I said, well, sir, you see, 
the, um, the Federal Artillery were here, uh, and they were bombing over here, and I managed to get through that. So, and at the end of this whole performance, he looked up and he said, what a very silly thing to do in your Easter vacation. <laughs> um, they then took a vote on whether to, um, in Cambridge it's called rusticate, throw me out of the college. And uh, they, by one vote, I was allowed to remain. So uh, it almost cost me like, my degree. How would you rate uh, the Italianness of Ticino? And does it feature in your book anywhere? Uh, it, it doesn't, actually. Um, the, um, I had not been in Ticino, I have to say, long enough to make a really uh, decent assessment of just how Italian it is. So far, what I've seen is, it, in some ways, really, you know, just little cultural things of cuisine and what have you are relatively different. It's clearly, it's, it's, it's one of those leakage areas, if you like, uh, from one country into the other. And it's a good illustration of how, you know, you, you can't constantly draw straight lines. I mean, Italy itself is, to some extent, like Spain, an accident of history. You know, the, where um, the borders lie has changed a lot, even in the, what is it, 150-odd years that Italy has existed. Nice began as being part of what we would think Italy would become. It's part of Savoy and therefore part of one of the states that became incorporated into a unified Italy. Trieste was not part of it at that stage, but then became incorporated. Um, if history had gone a different way, then the Alto Adige would certainly not belong to Italy. And if history had gone another way in another sense, then some of the areas down the Dalmatian coast might have been incorporated into Italy. So again, that's one of those areas where I think you've got to say there is a cultural Italianness, um, but it doesn't necessarily coincide exactly with the boundaries of the state. And often when I'm talking about, um, I, in the course that I give at Stanford, one of the things I talk about in the early stage is the making of Italy. How did it come into, into being? And how did people did people think of themselves uh, as Italians at different stages? Now, if you look back in history, you do see that people do refer to themselves as Italians, um, right the way through medieval and early modern um, times. They talk about Italy. But the comparison that I make is with Scandinavia that today we know what a Scandinavian is. We know that Scandinavia exists as a concept, but it's not a state. And that was very much the situation of Italy um, during the period before unification. It was a concept in people's minds, but it wasn't, it had no territorial expression. I need to talk about cookies for two seconds. Um, because this is the first time you've done SHP and you're here, let me just explain how it works. Right after these talks, what we do is we can all go on to Casa Fleming and we have cookies, other things like that set up. This is really your chance to sit down and talk to Mr. Hooper, ask any question you would like. Your future selves will be very disappointed with you if you pass up this opportunity. I can guarantee it. Um, I'll, I'll take the liberty of knowing your future selves um, better than you might like me to. In any case, right now we're just going to move over to Casa Fleming. Thank you very much for being a great audience and I will hope to see you over there.